Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're going to look at data collection which forms part of the measurements and errors topic in AQA A level physics. So in today's lesson we're going to try to understand how we collect data in a scientific investigation. So if we're being successful and we've learned in today's lesson you should be able to understand the different types of errors and how they can be reduced in an investigation, how you produce scientific results in an A-level format and how you can produce a valid investigative data collection, which forms part of the part of the following part of the AQA physics specification, handling data and the use and application of scientific methods and practices and numeracy in the application of mathematical concepts in a practical context. Now we're going to look at how to collect data in an investigation. Now data collection is an important component of scientific investigation. In an investigation you must decide the range of data you will collect, the interval of data you will collect, the number of data points you will collect and the number of repeats you should take. Now the range of data is the smallest value measured in the investigation to the largest value measured in the investigation. Now this value must be decided by the experimenter in the investigation and the range of the independent variable must be large enough to get a spread of data in the dependent variable. Now the smallest value must not give you a large percentage uncertainty in your values and the largest value must not be unsafe in your data collection. So you've got to consider all of those factors when you decide the range of data you wish to collect. Now another thing you've got to decide is the interval of data. This is the difference in, the measure, in between the measured values in an investigation. Now once again you have to decide this value as the experimenter in your investigation. Now the interval of the independent variable must be large enough to get different values for the dependent variable. Now the number of data points is the number of values measured in the investigation and once again the experimenter has to decide this in the investigation. Now there must be a large enough number of data points to be able to draw a confident line of best fit. So there has to be a minimum of at least seven different values for you to draw a confident line of best fit. And you've also got to be able to understand the number of repeats you wish to take in an investigation. So it's the number of different repeats of each value you would take in your investigation which you must decide yourself. Now the number of repeats should be enough to gain concordant results in the appropriate time constraints. So just to clarify, you must decide the following ideas as the investigator in an, an experiment. The range of data which is the smallest value measure the investigation to the largest value measure the investigation. Now the range of the independent variable must be large enough to get a spread of data in the dependent variable. You've got to consider the interval of data, the difference in between the measured values in the investigation. Now the interval of the independent variable must be large enough to get different values of the dependent variable. The number of data points, which is the number of values measured in an investigation. Now you must have a large enough number of data points to be able to draw a confident line of best fit. And this has to really be a minimum of seven different values. And you've also got to decide the number of repeats. How many repeats of each value is taken in an investigation? Investigation, and the number of repeats should be enough to gain concordant results in the appropriate time constraints. Now, for your experimental results, you should record your results in a results table. Now, your results table should include headings and units for all values. Now, it's important to note that when you carry this out, um, your results table should include a heading and units for all values. The units should be represented with a slash instead of a bracket sign and it may be appropriate to, cut, to place a prefix in your heading. Now it's important to note that the results should be given to the same number of decimal places in each column and you've got to give the experimental results to the correct number of decimal places. Now you give your examination answers to the correct number of significant figures. Now it's important to note that the number of decimal places you record values in a results table to is given by the resolution of the measuring device which you've used to collate that data. Now, for your experimental values, you should also include an uncertainty in your headings for your in your results table. Now, the uncertainty, once again, should be given to the same number of decimal places as the value recorded in the column. So you notice on the left-hand side, in this column, the uncertainty is given to one decimal place and the value is given to one decimal place. On the right-hand side, the uncertainty is given to no decimal places and the value is given to no decimal places. Now, equipment measured to half a unit, e.g. a thermometer measured to 
0.5 degrees Celsius should have measurements recorded to one decimal place and the uncertainty in these measurements will be plus or minus 0.25 but this will be rounded to give the same number of decimal places. So for example given measurements coded with an uncertainty of 1.0 plus or minus 0.3 degrees Celsius. Now the uncertainty can be given as either an absolute uncertainty or as a percentage uncertainty. Now when, when uncertainties have to be combined so you might have two columns which then combine to give a third column it's best to use percentage uncertainties. Now the precision of your results is linked to the spread of values of your repeats. So as a result it's very closely linked to the absolute uncertainty which can be calculated. Now when carrying out an investigation it's best practice to write up a results table roughly when completing the observations and then write these observations up neatly afterwards. Now there are also two types of errors in investigations. There are systematic errors and there are random errors. Now a systematic error is an error which can cause the same uncertainty in, on the experimental values for every measurement, whilst random errors are errors which cause different uncertainties on experimental results. Now it's important to note that systematic errors will affect the accuracy of the result, whilst random errors will affect the accuracy and the precision of the results. Now both these errors will affect the absolute uncertainty of the experimental values. Now to reduce the percentage uncertainty you've got to use larger values for experimental results or use a measuring device with a greater resolution. Now an example of a systematic error is a zero error, whilst an example of a random error is a parallax error. Now the impact of a systematic error is that it changes the intercepts of the graph but not the gradient. But the impact of a random error is that it changes the intercepts and the gradient of the graph. It makes the line of best fit difficult to plot. Now, to reduce a systematic error, you would change your experimental technique. For example, reset the voltmeter, ensure the balance is flat. But to reduce a random error, you carry out repeats until concordant results are achieved, you remove anomalies, and you calculate a mean average. Now, you could also reduce systematic errors by comparing the results with the ex an expected value and then subtract the error. Now, just to note, repeating and averaging the results for will only reduce random errors when the anomalies are removed from the results. Now systematic errors tend to be discovered when certain results are taken in investigations. Now you remove systematic errors by calibrating your equipment. Now what this means is you measure a known value and if there's a difference between the measured value and the known value this should be used to correct the error. Now looking at the impact of random and systematic error is a very common examination question on physics paper 3. Now the systematic and random errors produce the absolute uncertainty in an investigation along with the resolution of the measuring device. Now reducing the systematic and random errors in your investigation will reduce the absolute uncertainty in your investigation. So what have we looked at in today's lesson? Hopefully we can comment on experimental design and evaluate scientific methods. We know how to present data in appropriate ways. We can evaluate results and draw conclusions with references to measurement uncertainties and errors. We can identify variables that must be controlled, process and analyze data using appropriate mathematical skills as exemplified in the mathematical appendix for each science and consider margins of error, accuracy and the precision of data. So if we're being successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand the different types of error and how they can be reduced in investigation, detail scientific results in an A-level format, and produce a valid investigative data collection. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson looking at how we collect data in AQA A-level physics, which is part of the measurements and errors topic, and thank you very much, and have a lovely day.